Hello kind people of YouTube and welcome back to another video. Let's just take a quick look at today's crypto news and discussion together. First up, we have the Ripple CEO Brad Garlinghouse talking about XRP in relation to Ethereum because of course as they have been battling for the number two spot on some market cap aggregators for a while now, there is a lot of discussion around these two in relation to each other, in competition to each other. But Garlinghouse does not necessarily think they need to be in competition. Brad Garlinghouse in Ethereal Davis panel had a discussion with Joseph Lubin of the Consensus and Brian Behlendorf of the Hyperledger, of the Hyper, never mind, about the future of blockchain and cryptocurrencies. Talking about XRP overtaking Ethereum, Ripple CEO Brad Garlinghouse said, this is a marathon and not a sprint, and measuring the success of any platform in the day-to-day, hour-to-hour is a fool's errand, and I think all of the major platforms are working on interesting use cases. And I think we're still in the nascent stages of the market. I don't consider, and they just cut him off here. <clears throat> he continued saying that coin market caps rankings sometimes show XRP as number two, and sometimes it's number three, hoping that most people in the community agree with him. Once again, another sentence that makes no sense, but that is just what I expect from AMB Crypto. Garlinghouse added, I don't consider what Ethereum is doing in any way as a competitor with what's going on with the XRP ecosystem. Is there some overlap on occasion? Sure, probably, but I think you're going to see things play out in a long time. I think mostly we are all up here aligned with we seeing the overall market health and mature. Uh, once again, they seem to have messed up in taking down his quote here so in some ways, but... um. Uh, let's just quickly read the rest of this article because ultimately I just want to get down to his quotes here because I mostly agree with them, but let's just read the rest here. Moreover, he said that Ripple is championed and that there's a need for more transparency in the ecosystem. Once again, a sentence that made no sense, but we're going to move past that. Garlinghouse moved on to talk about decentralization and said that the word in itself is nuanced. This is something I've been saying on his channel over and over and over again. There is no such thing as being centralized or not centralized. There are a variety of ways in which you can be centralized and they always exist on a spectrum from less centralized to more centralized. That is something that everyone who wants to talk about crypto and about centralization and decentralization needs to be aware of. <clears throat> In addition, he said that Bitcoin and Ether were usually considered decentralized, but the mining aspects of it and the recent 51% attacks are some among the issues that make us question as to what decentralization really is. Furthermore, he continued that these issues needed to be addressed head on and illustrated what Joseph Lubin did recently was a step in the right direction. They don't qualify what the thing that Joseph Lubin did recently is. He fended off the FUD of XRP being centralized, saying that XRP Ledger was way more decentralized than mining-based solutions because of the nature of proof-of-work and decentralization that recently happened in China. Okay, let's start by talking briefly about decentralization here. Because he is making very legitimate arguments here, um, like I said just a moment ago, there are different ways in which you can be centralized or decentralized and it always exists on a spectrum. And um, there is supply centralization, which that is something that XRP really has to deal with because the XRP supply is very much centralized. But then there's the further issue that just being centralized or not being centralized does not automatically make something good or bad and does not automatically make something dangerous either. In XRP's case, a lot of the supply being centralized with the company Ripple is not a danger to the network and as such is not necessarily a bad thing because those coins cannot be used to attack the network. Those are all tied up in escrow and being released slowly over years. So the common argument for why supply centralization is dangerous is that too much supply in the hands of just a few people can be used to attack the network in a variety of ways. <coughs> Excuse me. You can use that to dump a bunch of coins onto the market to crash the price. In the case of proof of work solutions, you can often do 51% attacks. And XRP does not have to worry about that. So while XRP has a centralized supply, a relatively centralized supply, keep in mind it's nothing is ever fully centralized or fully decentralized, that is in this particular case simply not an issue. But if we're talking about decentralization of the computing power and hash power on a network, decentralization of mining, then some of the major proof of work cryptocurrencies seriously have an issue. Because there are, I believe, four accounts or four companies controlling over 
of the hash rate on Bitcoin, of the power on the Bitcoin network. That is a real danger to Bitcoin. And in that manner, Bitcoin is not decentralized. Bitcoin is very, very centralized when it comes to mining. And so are most proof of work cryptocurrencies. One of the reasons to move away from proof of work and to move to proof of stake is that it is less likely for centralization like this to occur. And even if it does happen, it is less dangerous for the network. So I just wanted to briefly get into this because this is a nuanced issue and we really need to talk about, um, we need to stop talking about this is decentral and uh, this is centralized and that makes it bad. We need to, we need to look at things more closely. We need to look at the different ways in which something can be centralized or decentralized and the different degrees and recognize that it is a spectrum. And also keep in mind that decentralized is not automatically bad and centralized is not automatically good. Um, for his bigger point here, and that is, I think, even more important, is um, he's pointing out here that it's not necessarily a competition between XRP and Ethereum. These are trying to do different things. They were created for different purposes. And there is some overlap somewhere. But nowhere else do we expect only one product to make it. So why would we, why would we frame everything in the crypto world as a battle? And why, why do so many people, so many maximalists for a variety of coins, usually Bitcoin, but there's maximalists for other coins as well. Why do they all think that everything else is doomed to fail except the one project that they happen to support? The crypto space is large and it is only going to grow in the future. And there's space for a lot of different technologies and products to exist within it. Actually, we all benefit from there being a variety of different products in it. Because if there is no competition, if there is one market leader with a full monopoly over the cryptocurrency space, what is the point in even still developing it further? What is the point in investing millions, in investing time and effort into further developing if you have no competition that you need to keep up with? The fact that there are a variety of cryptocurrency projects out right now is good for everybody. And they can coexist and they can, they can have different use cases. They can, they can do different things. Nobody expects the mobile phone space to only have Apple or only have Samsung in it. There are a variety of brands and some are bigger than others and some are smaller, but they do different things in the same space and they can coexist and the cryptocurrency space should be the same. And I think it's wonderful that Garlinghouse has been vocal about this. <clears throat> Next up, some alleged tech news out of Qtum X. And they, they are making a very impressive claim here. The team at Qtum X, an enterprise blockchain solution developed by Qtum, announced on January 22nd that they had successfully passed the 10,000 transactions per second barrier in stress tests. The team mentioned that in addition to achieving this critical amount of processed transactions, it should also be noted that the blockchain implemented efficient management of resources, avoiding the generation of empty blocks when there are no transactions between peers. Generated blocks and transactions are shown as follows. You can see that there are five blocks containing more, uh, containing more than 10,000 transactions, height 1,461, 1,459, 1,445, 1,439, and 1,433. This proves QtumX is able to handle more than 10,000 transactions per second. When there is no transaction, QtumX stops producing new blocks, which save storage and network resources. According to an explanation published on their official blog, the QtumX team mentions that the benchmark lasted only three minutes and the sender was executing three times. It is expected that soon more tests can be run in a testnet with longer duration. These results prove that the QtumX team is meeting the objective of developing a platform ideal for the development of dApps. The high number of transactions supported makes the development in this blockchain optimal for businesses that require a high level of interaction with users and customers. Okay, up to this point. Um, first up, if they really manage to achieve this, that is impressive. That is some of the best performance we have seen for any blockchain project. But you have to keep in mind here that this, is, this was created in a very particular environment. I believe this happened on a testnet and this was under exact controlled conditions. So whether, let's just assume that they're not lying about the fact that, um, that these happened at all. We have to keep in mind, this is not happening under real life conditions. Generally, a project will do better under idealized test conditions than in real life when it is properly applied. But either way, this seems very, very efficient. This seems very impressive. I just want to want to point those things out. Um, don't take this as gospel quite yet because we have gotten similar claims from a lot of different cryptocurrencies. Let's 
let's get into the second half of the, this article, and it kind of goes off the deep end. And so let's just start with this, um, with this um, subheading here. Transactions per second, the new way to measure how good a project is? Um, I don't know under which rock the author of this article has been living, but transactions per second have been the core way of how we have judged scalability for years. And scalability is one of the main problems that major cryptocurrencies have been facing. So this isn't a new way to measure how good a project is. This has been one of the core metrics that we look at for ages. We generally look at how fast it is, how it scales, read transactions per second, and then we look at the unique features it has. We look at um, we look at which privacy features it has. We look at which um, which smart contract features it has. We look at um, how well DApps can be built on top of it and all that other stuff. But transactions per second has been one of the core metrics for measuring how good a cryptocurrency project is for years. So this very this very subheading is just very confusing. Let's continue reading. It is also important to note that QTMX provably outperforms other blockchains focused precisely on speed and scalability. Once again, keep in mind here, this was um, this is all their claims. I don't believe this has been verified by an outside source. And this is also in, uh, in a controlled environment. Just as a reference, Bitcoin supports about 7, QTM about 70, Ethereum about 50. Among the top performers, XRP handles 1,500, Stellar and Tron 2,000, EOS about 4,000, and Nano 7,000. Now, the, the, all these numbers, in, in a better article, they would all be sourced. They are not. But I've seen most of these thrown around before, and this is a mix. This is a mix between the claims that companies have made about their own projects and the average speed of a network in real use. So um, you cannot compa compare these to the numbers from QTMX because the QTMX numbers were created under a different environment. Um, for instance, um, they're using here the 1,500 number for XRP. I believe that is based on actual network activity that has been shown on the network that has been verified. With the Ripple team saying the number can go significantly higher, I think I've heard over 10,000 thrown around. So why they would use, in other cases, the numbers that have been claimed by um, by companies and by projects rather than the numbers that have been proven and here use the proven one is a bit confusing. Um, and when, of course, some of the other stuff here, when they're talking about Bitcoin, for instance, they are talking about it without any second layer solutions running. Um, core Bitcoin is incredibly, incredibly slow and does not scale. It's also inefficient and extremely expensive because it was the first cryptocurrency project that made it to the market. Of course, its technology is more outdated. But um, ultimately, I just want to point out here that this is not a fair comparison. Other blockchains have promised to raise the bar to much higher levels. While it has been said that Visa supports about 2,000 transactions per second with theoretical peaks higher than 24,000, some startups have wanted to go beyond the limits of modern finance. MetaHash have promised to be able to support more than 100,000, an astronomical figure compared to current transactions. However, this figure falls short of the Ternio blockchain, which states to have achieved 1.2 million transactions per second, being able to support up to 10 million when required. However, so far, one of the projects that could comfortably wear the crown as the blockchain with the most transactions per second supported is Bexam, a network that claims to support 40 million transactions per second. Keep in mind, these are all the claims from these projects, and I'm unsure if any of these have been verified by an independent third party. Um, in the crypto space, what you will quickly notice is a lot of these smaller projects are making outrageous claims and many of them cannot back these claims up. Some of them even turn out to be outright frauds. I'm not claiming that any of these projects are frauds. I'm just warning you guys, don't take anything um, at face value. Look into independent third-party reviews of these technologies. Look into what is actually provably happening on their network. Not what is happening in controlled environments, not the data that the company behind these solutions is giving you, but look at what is actually happening on the network, what you can actually see for your own eyes and what independent third parties have verified. Okay, let's continue with some actual news. Nasdaq made a major, very interesting investment. Leading a $20 million Series B found a round of funding in capital market blockchain technology company Symbiont could arguably be Nasdaq's biggest crypto play to date. It comes right after Nasdaq CEO Adina Friedman gave further clues to Nasdaq's commitment to cryptocurrency and blockchain adoption this week. 
It could also mean Nasdaq will create a platform to issue and trade tokenized securities. Now this is interesting. Nasdaq Ventures has led, um, has led the round of funding to 2015 blockchain startup Symbiont and is joined by City Ventures, Galaxy Digital and Raptor Group. Very big names that we frequently see investing in crypto. Symbian describes Nasdaq as an anchor partner, which will benefit from developing applications on its Assembly Enterprise Blockchain and Smart Contract platform. According to the recent release, Assembly provides the opportunity for new participants to enter the digital asset market and offers existing participants a superior, sorry, a superior infrastructure on which to build the future of financial markets. Nasdaq will be using the platform to explore new business opportunities, as if they could have put it any more vaguely with clients looking for smart contract and tokenization solutions. Gary Offner, head of Nasdaq Ventures, says its investment helps build our future market infrastructure used by more than 100 marketplaces around the world. Revealing that as well as supporting a unique institutional application of blockchain that this latest investment will include the integration of Symbian's enterprise blockchain and smart contract platform into the Nasdaq financial framework. Once again, so vague as to essentially mean nothing. The Symbian and Nasdaq partnership could see Nasdaq quickly move into creating tokenized securities for clients as well as trading, something that has been rumored and connected with Symbian for the past few months. And we don't really need the rest of this article. I just wanted to flaunt this idea, to float this idea rather, that where it looks like Nasdaq might be looking to get even more deeply into crypto to launch tokenized, um, tokenized securities that would be a big, big step for Nasdaq. That would be once again even more, um, even more security and validity for people wanting to invest in the cryptocurrency market. And I'm very hopeful to see Nasdaq get even further into crypto. They have they have made a bunch of big moves in that direction already, and this is the latest one. This this twenty million dollar founding round. Last but not least, Overstock's T0 trading platform has officially opened. Um, I'm not going to read out this whole article because we talked about it the other day, but it is officially open now. Overstock's much-anticipated security token trading platform T0 officially began trading Thursday afternoon. The company announced in a press release that its secondary market for T0's own security tokens had gone live, marking the first step towards trading other digital assets on the platform. Accredited investors can sign up to trade T0 tokens through Dinosaur Financial Group, which is acting as the introducing or consumer uh, customer-facing broker-dealer. T0 subsidiary Pro Securities LLC is providing the alternative trading system to trade the tokens. Investors in the T0 token offering have long been waiting for the platform's launch after its initial unveiling in 2015. Overstock CEO Patrick Byrne announced that the exchange would launch this week during the North American Bitcoin conference in Miami on January 18th, later telling Coindesk that the technology was ready but the company needed to finish processing its initial signups first. And this is really all we need here. Bottom line, this platform is now live. It will, it will gain a lot more capabilities in the future, but getting it live in the first place was a big step. Of course, this has been in the works for four years with a lot of people already putting a lot of money into it especially with their um, proprietary token. So it's very nice to see this finally go live. Overstock, of course, a company that has been supporting crypto for a long time and was also the first major US retailer to accept cryptocurrency payments on their web store. So this is very good to see and just, just more evidence that the crypto world is rapidly developing, rapidly building more of an infrastructure, more of a baseline, more of a foundation for whenever that next bull run hits us. And with that, I'm going to end today's video. As always, thank you so much for watching. All the links to these articles are in the description as well as my social media links and ways to support the channel. If you enjoy my videos, I would really appreciate it if you could just leave a like, leave a comment. It really helps the channel out. It really helps my videos get discovered. And especially in this extended bear market, it is very hard for crypto YouTubers to get discovered, to gain views. So I would really appreciate that. Thanks for watching and I'll be back with you with another video tomorrow.